Hey everybody, it's Dr. B back. Um, gonna talk about subroutines today, and um, this is something that hopefully will kind of look familiar in its own way. So subroutines um, are how effectively how we implement methods in, in, in assembly. They're not methods, they're a lot simpler, but the basic idea is there. These are a, a reusable section of code that we can call similar to how we would call a Java method or a function in C or Python or anything like that. Um, and it can return back uh, to where it was called when it's done. Um, kind of important that to how we, we look at these is uh, when we examine these at the assembly code level, you can actually start seeing some of the mechanisms by which uh, not just the subroutines and assembly, but how the functions and methods and things in your higher level languages operate as well, because those those functions and methods um, use uh, subroutines at the, at the assembly level. A um, few things to understand about subroutines. They have an entry point. Um, this is simply an address of the first uh, assembly instruction in that subroutine. We typically represent it by an assembly label, but we don't have to. We could simply represent it by an address. Um, we can think of this as the method header in Java, roughly speaking, um, but really it's just a label that is the name uh, of the beginning of that subroutine. Um, and the end of the subroutine is something we call a RTS instruction. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, one thing to note is that uh, subroutines in 6502 um, do not have any inbuilt notion of parameters or return values. Uh, we have to code those in uh, by hand ourselves. All right, so the two instructions that are that are important for subroutines are JSR, which means jump to subroutine. Um, its operand is the address that um, begins that subroutine. Um, and usually, again, we put a label in there. So it'll look something like this, JSR with a label like enable sprite zero. So if we have created a subroutine um, using the label enable sprite zero, JSR will take us to that. And as I mentioned before, RTS is the return from subroutine. When we encounter that, it will return from the subroutine uh, back, hopefully, and to the JS, the jump subroutine that called it. Um, it is possible to to corrupt that and change things around, but we won't go into that and we won't, uh, we, we hope you won't <laughs> encounter that situation. Um, additionally, on on the Commodore 64 emulator and, and how things are set up there, you, and the very last RTS instruction in the program actually ends that program and returns uh, control back to the kernel. Um, and we've seen this already in some of the the assembly codes that we've written, um, you'd have an RTS as the last thing in the program. And this kind of hints at a larger idea that, you know, on a computer, separate programs, in a way, really aren't separate. They're really loaded in and called as part of the operating system as simply just code that's linked in from the operating system. Um, and when those programs return, i.e. when they hit that last return statement, um, control returns back to the operating system. All right, so here is a example of a short subroutine. First thing I want you to know is that we give it a comment, similar to a method comment in Java, the kind of thing we've, we, we've repeatedly talked about in courses like CS1. Um, so I, I've given it a description. In this case, it stores an address to the um, zero page addresses FB and FC. And uh, if you recall from the address modes lecture, this is one of those places in the zero page that we can use for uh, indirect addressing. So it, it would be useful to have a way to um, very quickly copy a, uh, an address over to that. Uh, the inputs are the accumulator and uh, the X register. So I've listed those under inputs. Under outputs, I've listed, of course, FB and FC. So FB will have the low byte of the address. FC will have the high byte of the address. So the name of my subroutine is uh, 
given by a label, set indirect address, and uh, by convention we will capitalize those. We don't have to, but uh, I ask that you do to make things more readable. And uh, in this I'm simply just storing X to high byte, storing A to the low byte, and then I have an RTS which um, ends that subroutine and returns to caller. Okay, let's get into the details of subroutines and how they work a little bit. And the main thing with subroutines is the stack. So the stack is, um, if you recall, it's, uh, if I remember, it's page one, I believe. I might be wrong, it's been a while. Um, there's, a, there's a whole page in, um, in memory that is a stack, 256 bytes. And um, its main function is to support subroutines. Specifically, when we do a jump to subroutine instruction, it pushes the return address to the stack, meaning where we're going to come back to when we see an RTS instruction. Um, now, be a little more specific, it actually pushes the return address minus one. Um, then, later in our program, when we encounter an RTS instruction, it expects the return address to be whatever is on top of the stack. And so it will pull that, add one to give us the actual return address, and then load that into the program counter uh, to be the next instruction executed. So here's an example. We see a JSR um, to address 2000 starting at, and it's at, at uh, 1000. It will push 1002 to the stack and then jump to 2000. 2000, the subroutine will execute, there'll be lots of instructions in there, yada, 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 and then we see an RTS. The RTS will pull that 1002 off the stack, add one to it, and there's our next instruction. Now, why, why, is, it, why is the return address always two past um, the address of the JSR, well, it has to do with JSR is three bytes long. So 1000, uh, 1001, 1002 would be the bytes that this instruction takes up. So it's really, this is the last byte of the JSR instruction. All right, let's look at a, a slightly more complicated example. We have a lot of code here, there's the dot, dot, dots, or I mean, I'm just leaving stuff out that's un not interesting to us. Um, mostly just a bunch of jump subroutines and their return from subroutine uh, cohorts. And I have an empty stack, so I'm assuming there's nothing uh, been called yet. I've executed my 1000 and I jumped subroutine to 2000. So I pushed 1002 onto the stack. Well, 2,000 is a jumper subroutine to 3,000, so let's see what happens. We jump to 3,000 and we push 2,002 on, uh, onto the stack. Well, 3,000 is a jump subroutine 4,000, so it's going to push 3,002 onto the stack and jump to 4,000 here. 4,000 is a jump subroutine to 5,000, so it's going to push 4,002 onto the stack and jump to 5,000. There. Now, 5,000 is our first return from subroutine. So it's going to pull what's on the top of the stack, add one to it to know where to return. So the stack becomes the way we remember where we were and where we need to return back to. So there we go. We pull our 4,002 off the stack. We add one to it. We get 4,003 as our new address. That gets loaded into the program counter, so we jump to that point in in the code and oh look hey we've got another RTS so we pop an address off the stack if this in case it was 3002 so we add one to that to get 3003 and now we're here and of course we got another RTS because of the way we set this up so we're gonna pull our 2002 off the stack add one to it uh, and it sends us to address 2003 which of course is another RTS return from subroutine. So we're going to once again pull from the stack 
get our 1002, add one, and then our next instruction executed will be 1003. Now, let's look at a, a, a recursive situation. I have a subroutine called my subroutine. The first instruction in it is jump subroutine my subroutine. What is going to happen in this situation? My subroutine jumps to my subroutine, so it pushes to the stack. Goes to here. Oh, but it pushes to the stack again, and then it pushes to the stack again, and it pushes to the stack again. It's going to do this until it fills up the stack. And if we remember that the stack can only hold 256 bytes, at two bytes per address, we can only hold 128 addresses. So if it does this a maximum of 128 times, we're actually going to overflow the stack. Um, and if I recall how the stack pointer works, we'll actually wrap back around. And it will just keep doing this probably to infinity until we shut the, the program down. You've seen this before in Java. So you most likely you've done you've, you've seen Java's stack overflow error. Uh, this happens when you have a recursive function that is not properly written, or if you have functions that call other or you have a method that calls another method that calls the first method and kind of in a circular pattern. Um, again, it's re that's recursion uh, without uh, properly ending the recursion. Um, you do that. And you're going to have a method that just keeps calling itself over and over and over and over. And in Java, similar to how subroutines work in 6502, there is some information pushed to the stack with each of those calls. Um, in Java, it's a little bit more. It has all the parameters and has all local variables and things like that. So as more information gets pushed to the stack every time, but the stack is finite. So eventually, we've pushed so much information to that stack that it overflows. So in Java, we don't wrap the stack around, which would actually be kind of dangerous. In Java, once the stack runs out of, out of uh, space, we get stack overflow error. And it's the same kind of mechanism that's, that's happening uh, with subroutines, just uh, you know, in Java, we don't, we don't let the rollover thing happen. One last little bit of things to talk about with subroutines. Um, in, in Java and other languages, uh, when we call a method or a function, we push a, a good bit more information to the stack. Um, yes, we push the return address, but we also push um, the values of any parameters. Um, we push the values of any local variables. Um, a lot of times we even push a piece of allocated space to hold the return value. So there's a lot goes goes on when uh, we call a, a method in Java or C or something like that. Uh, similarly, this is complete. Well, this is analogous to at the assembly level, we would push the values of all registers, um, any local variables we set up, um, anything like that. Um, which that doesn't happen with, with 6502 automatically. Um, it does with some architectures, but not, not 6502. Um, partly just because we don't have a lot of stack space. It's very limited at 256 bytes. Um, another is uh, 6502 doesn't, doesn't handle indirect addressing very well, and that's um, something that's particularly useful when we're doing this. But anyway, um, that's subroutines. Uh, mostly just want you to understand how uh, jump subroutine and return from subroutine work, as well as the limitations of stack. Um, so we, particularly uh, with the stack limitations, we don't want um, to have a, a chain of subroutine calls very deep. Uh, once we go past about 100, 128, depending on where, how much is used by the kernel, um, we're going to run out of space and our, our program is going to execute incorrectly. All right. As always, if you have questions, please ask. You can email me or you can ask them in class. Thanks and have a good day.